when people are, are sleep deprived and then when they when they are getting enough sleep. And it, it can be a combination of things too, like, you know, other stressors and maybe not eating properly and all but um, this is sleep that that does, you know, that, I bet some of y'all are sick more than you used to be just trying to the devil work and school and family and all that kind of thing and it's like what you can do about that. But it does, it does make you more susceptible to infection too under those, those kind of stressors. So just so you know, and I, I don't want to stress extremely over that that chapter in it about all the, the immune system function. That it's that's really pretty pretty crazy and that all of that stuff that's going on. I, I really tried to in the, at least in the PowerPoint, I mean, the, the, the Iggy chapter is is more detailed than what I have on the PowerPoint. So it, and the stuff that's that's in that's, that's got to do with all of that. Pay more attention to the PowerPoint, and if you need clarification, you can go to the EV, because it's really, really detailed. But I, I thought it was a good thing for you to read it, because the more that you read about it, it's sort of like the neurological system and the, the cranial nerves and all that kind of stuff. I, you know, every time I read about it, I get a better understanding of it, but I, if I don't use it a whole lot, it kind of kind of fades a, a little bit, and then you got to, got to kind of uh, review it. That's, so that's really why I had you to read that chapter. It uh, doesn't mean you've got to memorize everything in that chapter. And I told you some things yesterday about that you don't have to memorize this, but this is a good FYI to kind of you know give you some of the details and and um, about what all those blood cells do. I want you, I do want you to memorize what's in the chart. I think I said that yesterday, but just to, just to reiterate, because the the notes page is very very busy on that, but um, it just gives you more information about what what do neutrophils do. Like you might want to look at that and what's at the bottom of that page when you're interpreting your labs and clinical. Um, and and you're, we're going to expect you now, since we told you about what's in the differential for white blood cells, that we're going to expect more of you now that you've you studied that. Uh, why are your neutrophils high? Why are the neutrophils low? Why are one of the sites high? Why are one of the sites low? And that might um, that be a, a good thing to look at to interpret your, your, your white blood cell differential. So, so you, but just do, do memorize what's on the chart. That's, that's going to be the, the, what, the whole point of doing all this. This is really um, a review of anatomy and physiology, but it, it's, that's really hard to jump in with immunity. I think you just have to go through some of these, these um, introductory things for the other to make sense. So this is really the meat of what we're trying to study here. Hypersensitivity, RA, and, and lupus. Those, those are our three exemplars. So. Anyway, the, the, this is when our immune system is hyperactive. And Ms. Walker's going to talk about when it's hypoactive. So uh, that's going to be the, the opposite poles there. But anyway, there's, uh, <coughs> hypersensitivity is, is when, when it, it, it kind of goes wacko. Remember the, the guy with the pigs and everything, and he says, well, you talk about all these antigens and the bacteria and viruses and stuff in response to that. But then sometimes, like a little bit of pollen or a peanut or whatever sneaks in, and, and your immune system recognizes that it's foreign for some reason, that it's a non self cell or it's, a, it's an enemy, a foreign enemy or something that needs to come in and destroy. And so then that's that's what's, what's going on here. Um, it, you can have just the bothersome thing like a runny nose or. or um, watery eyes, um, sneezing and things like that, or, or it can cause anaphylaxis sometimes with the, with the peanuts so, um, and, and other sorts of, of um, allergies where you actually do um, have an and those sort of things. So, anyway, um, uh, I don't know if looking at it, um, in the Giddens book, I think it, it gives you a little um, information too about the um, how it sort of can be be categorized, like that, um, and what can influence, and gender can influence, and like lupus and uh, lupus is ten times more common in women than, than men, and, and there I've seen very statistics on that too. I think in another part of the in the um, in the lupus <laughs> section, this is nine times, but it's, it varies according to the age, and so that that's why it's, it, it um, just depends on who which which population of women that you're. That you're looking at, but anyway, it's it's much much greater incidence in women than men. I don't have to remember the ten that much, but and then race, African Americans have are eight times more likely to be a and, um, and more so than Caucasians and non and, um, um, and then um, genetics. If, if um, allergies run in your family, you may not have the same allergy, but you're more susceptible to, to having allergies. Than you have um, allergic reactions in your family. Um, and then medications. 
uh, penicillin and, and um, monoclonal antibodies. Like my dad's allergic to penicillin, and um, not anybody else in my family that I know of anyway. But but that's something to be real wary of. It's like you know that, that may be something to say if you go in the hospital and, and you know one of your parents or siblings is allergic to to an antibiotic. You might want to say, well, you know, it does that does run in my family, but I've never had problems with it. And, I always tell my clinical group we're the one over antibiotics. Um, anybody can be developing the sensitization to an antibiotic, and the next dose may send them over the edge. The next pig that you eat may send you over the edge. You don't know that you're building up antibodies and things like that. We can't just live in fear necessarily, but we, especially as nurses and different medications, and all we have to like, realize that the, the next dose might be the one that is sent over the edge. To the Antibodies um, like the, um, the Herceptin, and there's some of those that, that can be given for rheumatoid arthritis. Some of those um, can, can cause allergic reactions too. The body can uh, recognize them as an onset. So, um, oh, I was gonna say something from back here, and I can't know what it is now. Oh, and mold and all that kind of stuff. Oh, I know, my, my daughter. Um, so it was October before last. We were at a um, conference, a community college conference, um, so for faculty and, and staff from all over the state, um, and then in Raleigh at the Convention Center and all that. And, and uh, my daughter called me and said she had to go to the ER with asthma like symptoms. And she just couldn't get her breath, and it was just really scary, and you couldn't figure out what the hell was going on. And what, what had aggravated, she had had some exercise related asthma in junior high, like if she was. They were making them run and, you know, for endurance and stuff like that. But she, she would have some problems in and had, a, had an inhaler with her in, in PE class and all. But then it kind of, it hadn't really surfaced until just fairly, until that, that particular time and didn't really know what had elicited it because she hadn't really been, you know, anything that, that exertional. But they ended up doing allergy testing on her and everything was negative. All the, every single thing was negative. Nothing, nothing ever showed up anymore. And they finally came to the conclusion that, that um, some people are allergic and display those kinds of symptoms, and then other people respond in that way to irritants, that it is not an immune-mediated response. It's just that your body is, <coughs> like if, like if, uh, if, you, if you, uh, something goes down the wrong way in your airway, it's, it just, it's irritating your airway. You, you, uh, you uh, um, aspirate your cornbread or something like that, and you and you try to you cough, 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 cough. That's that's really just an irritant response, and that that's what pretty much what they said was when Sarah would have those asthma-like symptoms that it's a it's just an irritant response. So it may not don't always assume that it is allergy. You have to look at that as a as a real possibility, of course. But but it might not be. It's not always. Allergy is, and that's one reason why antihistamines never would work for her because every, all of the allergy symptoms that she has are irritant symptoms, and, and antihistamines are not going to clear up irritant symptoms. So, so just be aware of that. Okay. I can get this. There we go. I just barely touched it and it went to the right one. Thank goodness. Okay, type one. We, this is stuff that you do need to know. You do need to know what each of the types do. So, and this, and you do need to know that it has to do with IgE, that antibody that we talked about yesterday. That's why we talked about that. You know, and I said you need to know what these these uh, antibodies do. So, type one IgE. So you do have to know that. It's very very common. This is um, it, it, the allergen interacts with free IgE when you have that antibody in, in your system. Um, it's, it's going to, to cause um, a, a lot of a lot of production of more antibodies with the irritants or allergies. I it can be an irritant or an allergy. So anyway, the IG the IgE causes the the symptoms in your way. Um, and then the, it can be food foods um, that can be be eaten, you can be breathing it in, you can um, absorb it through your skin. Um, they're, they're just all different tons of roots that things can get in, into you that uh, can cause this, this type 1 hypersensitivity. So it, it can be just as simple as, as sneezing um, or watery eyes, but then it can be as bad as, as um, anaphylaxis as, as well. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Y'all know 
know a little bit about that. I know because that's on the clinical. Um, but the, the most common um, type of one is just things like what has one and rhinitis. Who's rhinitis? Yeah. 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 This usually means an inflammation. But, okay. So, um, the mast cells in the basal fields and the, the granules in the basal fields release the histamine, and um, then that, that calls in, in other troops to, to call, call some, some more symptoms. And um, that shouldn't be dangerous to our body, but the body's reacted to it anyway. So, um, and uh, with, with an anaphylactic reaction, you've got the, got the itching or hives, um, angioedema, that non-pitting and non-dependent swelling of the skin. You know what dependent means when you talk about dependent edema? Just yeah, where it pulls, and it's sort of like it's a gravity thing. You know, wherever you're, like if you're, if you're moving your arms hanging down, Sometimes like when you walk for a long time, you can swing your arms and that's your fingers get swollen, your rings get tight, you burn in the sap. And then, you know, especially that people with congestive heart failure have, have more swelling where? Where's the first place you want to look? And just, what? Yeah, feet and legs, exactly. Because that's where the gravity's pulling on you the most if you're up and walking or if you're sitting with your feet down. That's why lazy boys are so great. You can um, recline or so you can uh, raise up your, uh, your legs and, and um, uh, if, if you have swelling. So anyway, um, so there's all, all those other kinds of um, the symptoms that it, there, it's in that paragraph describing anaphylaxis, and we are going to get to that on another page too, but that, does, that is part of, of um, the a type 1 can, can be as severe as, as those other symptoms with the air hunger highs, uh, bronchial constriction, wheezing, barking, cough, all that kind of thing. Um, and you can actually go in shock. Uh, in that, in that shock. So one thing that students just seem to have a hard time grasping is that histamine is a phasodilator. And it, it, it really makes sense if you think about like, like these basic filling granules are, are um, spreading out the, the histamine and brave kinins and all that kind of stuff, the, all those modulators of inflammation. Um, and that can, that can be going on in a, like an inflammatory response too. And, and when, when that inflammatory response is going on along with all, all of this, what, what's one of the symptoms of, of inflammation? Heat, well, they have the heat. Yeah, the heat. And what, what else? Swelling. Swelling. Right, right. So edema is a, a side effect of the, that most of those mm -hmm. modulators or the um, inflammation modulators are vasodilators. The histamine in particular definitely is a vasodilator. So um, it, it's in your, when your nose is stuffy, if you're thinking about your nose being stuffy, you may be thinking, oh, it's constricted because, because my nose is stuffy and I can't breathe. Well, it, it's stuffy because it's swollen in there. It's not, and, and then there's, there is mucus in a lot of times too. There's mucus blocking the path of the, the airways. Um, but, but then again, um, a lot of the, the swelling like for, for or, or a lot of the constriction with asthma is from, from what? Besides, there, are, there may be extra secretions, but what's really closing the airways? It's the edema, right? The edema is constricting the airways. So just do remember that. That's what classes before have just had trouble conceptualizing that. When you think about bronchial constriction or constriction of your, your sinuses and you, know, you can't breathe and be a stuffy and all that, that it's, that it's a constrictor. But it's, it's really a dilator, and the dilated the, the dilation pulls, um, it pulls uh, fluid into the tissues, and then the, that fluid is causing the constriction. But it is not a constrictor itself. It is a, a, a dilator. So the phase of dilation causes it, lets it leak out into the tissues. You end up having this capillary leak kind of thing going on. Okay, so that, does that make sense? It does. It seems just the opposite, but it's but it's really not. It's, it dilates. It does not. It, the, the result in the tissue is, it, or the in the airways is constriction, but in the tissues it is definitely all, all dilated. So, okay. So that's that's just a very very important point. Ah. All right. 
This is this is sort of strange. I don't know why it's sideways like this, but that's that's the way it, it came out. That was in our, our concept book, and I bet I think it just came with the figures that you can get with the textbook resources and everything, and there must have been a, another chart right there, so I don't know why it's such a crazy thing. But anyway, this, this just gives you um, a, a picture of what happens in with the IgE. The antigen comes in, and there it is, and then the, the plasma cells produce a large amount of the IgE antibodies against it because they, they've seen it before, and so that IgE just, just <coughs> keeps on producing. Um, in response to the antigen, and then the antigen, the, I, the IgE antibodies attach to the mast cells in the body tissues. And this is mast cell with fixed IgE antibodies, granules containing histamine. Subsequent or secondary responses, more of the same allergen enters the body, um, and then then you can kind of see that it's it's really messing with the cell. Okay, and histamine and other chemical mediators are are coming in here. The outpouring of fluid from the capillaries. That's that's what I was talking about. Histamine causes an outpouring of fluid from the capillaries. And if you can look at this little picture in, on the slide, it'll show up a whole lot better on your computer screen than, it, than you're able to see now or, or, or on the printed out. But that's that's the real key, outpouring of fluid from, from the capillaries. And then, then you've got the um, then there's mucus production as part of that inflammatory response. That's, that's part of the um, the exudate, remember the exudative phase of inflammation? And then you get um, constriction of the small respiratory um, passages. I couldn't read that word, it's so blurred right now at the bottom. So the respiratory passages, the fluid that's, that's in the tissues is constricting the, the, um, the, the passages. Not, it's not that the histamine was constricting, it was actually dilating. So. Anyway, I think that's a, that's a good picture. It's just so busy and it's so tiny, you can't really see it on your printout. So, um, so we, you can look at the list of all the things that, that you know, there, that's not the only, the only ones, but that, that's a, there's a really nice list of pollen and food and drugs and insect products and all that kind of thing can be, uh, you know, list of this kind of response. So, and, um, there are common agents that cause anaphylaxis and on page 385 and 80. Also, it can give you some more examples, but you, you probably already know a lot of that. Okay, so are y'all good with the with the type one? All right, here we go. Type two. It's called cytotoxic. So, what does cyto mean? Cell. 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 Toxic, of course. It's poison, right? Poison to the cells. Okay. So, this is IgG or IgM antibodies that, that work on this. Um, this isn't quite as important about that which antibody was in this particular one, but um, remember that, that blood transfusion reactions, if you have a mismatched blood type or mis mismatched other other kinds of um, antibodies in, in your in your system, um, sometimes when people have had a, a, a drug, I mean a, a blood transfusion reaction in the past, they will um, they will do, they'll do a cross, they, they always do a cross match. So your blood type's not likely to, to change unless you have a, a bone marrow transplant with somebody that has a, a different blood type. And that's, that's not something that's, that frequently happens, but your blood type's not going to be changing. And people wonder, well, why do you have to, to do another another um, type of cross every time we uh, get a blood transfusion after like 72 hours? Why well, we have to keep having that? Y'all know why they have to do it repeatedly? Well, the antibodies, yeah, you can be developed, you can have developed antibodies to, to the previous, yes, to, to previous um, uh, antigens that were on other transfused, or maybe something else that you didn't expose to. And you, you just, um, it's not safe to wait more than uh, 72 hours to, to um, do another cross match. That's the real important part. They do, um, they do like foods testing and all, the, all these other kinds of things that can identify antibodies that maybe are more common, um, that more commonly can cause transfusion re reactions besides the, the um, ABO kind of thing, the blood type. And um, this, this type, this type 2, is also the, the, um, the RH factor issue. When an RH negative newborn has an RH positive mom, and um, that's what I was thinking about yesterday. They're, they're studying all this with, with what does actually go through the placenta 
from the baby to the mom and from the from the mom to the baby they think that that uh, blood doesn't really join but there are some things that they're, they're finding it um, I think it's, it's just they're, they're easily more easily detecting that some of their cells do do get through and the antibody reduction may have started way before the birth happens a lot of times they used to think it happened just during the birth because of all the trauma of birth on the placenta but um, it may really be And then, then attack the baby's blood, and then they, they used to have these blue babies where they, they just were the, the, the mom's um, antibodies would, would get in there and, and start destroying the, the baby's blood, and they have had all these transfusions. And now they give a, a drug for, for that to the RH negative moms. And what is that called? Rodian. Rodian, yeah. And that's one thing um, I, I did um, in OB clinical, it's mostly uh, observational, but we ended up um, in. And, uh, mother baby um, doing uh, some rhodium shots um, for, you, and that's that's one of the things where this may not be your patient, but the nurses are like, hey, we have an IM injection. Y'all don't give any opportunities to do IM injections except for maybe a few flu shots. And does anybody give you a flu shot? Mm -hmm. This, yeah, and I know mm -hmm. that um, yes, yeah, some of my students have done the flu shots, and so you do get to do some IMs that way. But that is one, hopefully. Um, Penicillin, encephalosporins, and other antibiotics can cause hemolytic anemia. So um, you may see that. You may see some of your patient um, having a low hemoglobin, and, and if you know that they just had a, a recent reaction to uh, a large reaction to a, a drug, then, then you can go know that. But that, that may be the reason for the anemia. So, um, anyway, withdrawing the drug. Um, in those cases will stop that cell destruction process, but then that means what forever? You, you can take away, away the drug and then you'll probably never have a reaction like that again, and if you never do it again. <laughs> right, right. So, and, and sometimes there's crossover um, allergies with um, what from, uh, penicillin is the most common drug allergy. What, what's another antibody that's related to penicillin that can have? Cephalosporin, exactly. Yeah, and I, I can't remember for sure if it's like 20 or 25 percent crossover, something like that. I mean, that's that's pretty much. But but a lot of times uh, the students will be looking at that and saying, well, why if they're allergic to penicillin, why are they on the cephalosporin? Because there's other antibiotics, and why are we 
putting them to that risk, but but um, sometimes if they do, if their infection is bad enough, and that particular drug is the best in the um, in the um, um, culture and sensitivity sensitivity results, if it's if the supposed is the best on the sensitivity results. Then, then they may switch them for something else to a cephalosporin just to get the, the infection down. Because you have tremendous, tremendous problems with, with some infections, when you, especially when there's it's sepsis it's all over the body and, and you're in shock and all that kind of stuff. Yes, sometimes it's, sometimes it's worth it to get the right antibiotic to, to get the cause of the infection um, cleared up. So and a lot of times in, in, when you're talking about medications, there, there are a lot of contraindications and you're wondering why the doctor put the patient on this if it's... Maybe it's not totally contraindicated, but of course it is, it is totally contraindicated if you know you have an allergy to penicillin, it's totally contraindicated to ever take penicillin again, right? That, so that's a, that's a total white kind of thing. So the way it is, the seven score could be a 25% cost over the average. Then generally, you may be weighing the risk and the benefits, and, and maybe, maybe the benefits can outweigh if it's going to kill the, the, uh, the bacteria there. So, Sometimes it's a good idea to ask those questions, though, because sometimes maybe somebody missed it. You know, you, it doesn't hurt to ask about it. So, um, but that, that's usually an answer that you'll get. Okay. And sometimes um, the body just has this particular kind of reaction against its own tissues. And there, you may hear this again, good pastures syndrome. Um, the lungs and, and kidneys can be attacked in, um, in this way, and they're, they're, those antigens appear on the, the uh, cell surface, and then the antibodies are being um, uh, produced. And then the complement cascade, that complement just is this sort of an inflammatory thing we talked about yesterday, which destroys the cell. Um, so lungs and kidneys is good pastures, and then that Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Did y'all do that? So just think of the Hashimoto's thyroiditis and, and um, he, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. There are some people that just their their body is is um, is attacking their own red blood cells and they they will be anemic. So so that's uh, but the, the really the transfusion reaction and those drug reactions are the ones that you need to really really be paying attention to. Oh, this doesn't do anything. I think this is disabled. So I think I hit something that made it. I might have just broken it. Broke my pen while I so, All right, what time is it? I bet y'all are ready for a break. I didn't know we were going to be so so long with it. really intended to make all these classes till 12, but you know, we're not going not gonna to try to do that today. But, but now Thursday, it is 12. That, the Monday and Thursdays are until 12. And the Tuesday and Wednesdays are not. But we're not going to have more Tuesdays and Wednesdays anymore. So. Okay, and this this one is is um, another picture, just like the, the other. But it's, it's a type 2 reaction, the cytotoxic reaction. And there it talks about the IgG and IgM rather than IgD making the... I mean, I G E, all those letters, this alphabet suit's getting me all mixed up. But, but anyway, the, um, the antibodies that attack it, and it's sort of similar anyway, but it's, it's like it's, it's attacking cells is what it is um, uh, more than anything here instead of the, uh, but it, you know, the cells can die with, it, with the other kinds as well. But this is the, this is the one that called the cytotoxic. And then um, the, this either, either um, causes lysis of the cell or a phagocyte comes in and gets it, or a killer T cell comes in and gets it. So it can die a whole lot of ways. The cell can die a whole lot of ways um, with this particular type of reaction. One of the things I was going to ask Ms. Um, Ms. Hyde, yeah, that's what we were saying in yesterday faculty meeting that about um, this particular one. I added in these, these um, slides last year because some of the programs that were, there, all of the um, ADM programs in the state have to use the concept-based curriculum. And we don't have to do everything identically, but there's certain things we are supposed to, to do. 
do. We can't delete anything from the curriculum, but we can add some things in. And some things that were, they, they thought, some of the other schools thought was really lacking in what what's, people are really missing a lot on their, um, uh, their standardized test, not just the NCLEX, but the standardized test that leading up to that, um, is, is um, called ITP. And we, we talked about hemolytic anemia, where it's destroying um, red blood cells. But this one, have y'all heard of idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura? Anyway, and that's that's what Joey was saying in his mom thought for for her um Gillian Barrett. But anyway, um, the antibody molecules are listed, elicited by certain drug molecules or viruses, and then the antibodies um, join with the antigens on the surface of the platelets. And so that's just a, a mismatch thing. It's a mistake, but that's they think that the platelets are, are enemies. And so um, the, the platelets are, um, the complement activation happens like you see in that picture, and then the thrombocytes are destroyed, so the cell has been um, toxically attacked. So, um, and then there's an impaired blood clotting mechanism. If you go down to just um, any, any um, platelets. And, and uh, so what are you going to have if you, um, if you have an impaired platelet function? Bleeding. Certainly very susceptible to bleeding. So it can, uh, sometimes the ITP, some people say it's immune thrombocytopenic purpura. But what's, a, what's purpura? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's bruises all bigger than the TPI of the little tiny pinprick size. And then if you just say like a bruise, it, you, you kind of think of it as being it's fairly small, but if it's purpura, it's, it's bigger blobs of purple, right? I mean, it's really, it's, it's, I don't think they have exactly a number of centimeter or whatever, but it is, it's, it's bigger than the TPI. Anyway, um, so on the screen is actually where the, uh, that destruction is going on. And the uh, um, bone marrow production of platelets is normal. So you can go in, in, in um, and do a, a bone marrow test, and the uh, production of the megakaryocytes, that's what, what um, breaks up into the, the little fragments, which are platelets. But if there's plenty of megakaryocytes um, in the bone marrow, but then you don't see the platelets in the circulation. But, so that means that the spleen is filtering out and, and destroying them, thinking that they're the enemy. So uh, when the, the destruction exceeds the production, then the platelet count's going to go down. That just makes sense. So, and then, then bleeding can certainly happen at the, the least little thing. And uh, it's the most common bleeding disorder in children. And uh, I don't know if they really know why, but I guess the, um, their immune system may not be um, mature enough to, to fight specifically the virus and let the virus can influence the body into attacking the plants or some kind of drug that they, they get their, their body recognizes it as something something foreign. But anyway, it's um, about two to ten years in children, but you can also have it in certainly have it in adults. We, we used to treat adults with the um intravenous immune globulin in, in our office if they had ITP and uh, it says it usually follows a viral illness, and, um, and, and it, that's, that's, that's the case in a lot, of, a lot of times with the adults, too. But sometimes you just don't know. But um, the, the student that I, that I was talking about, her, she, has, she has it herself, and her two kids have it. And so they, but they have flare-ups, and then they have to be on it, which are being in the lobby, and then it might kind of die down a little bit, and then, then they'll have to do it again. So, and, the, the thing is, we were on, I'll just, I think it's on another slide, I hope I'll probably get ahead of myself, but anyway, um, you can see the clinical manifestations of, of having fewer platelets and all that, that's, that's certainly obvious, but um, half the children have complete remission at some point, and then if there's no response to meds after six months to a year, then they usually take the spleen out, because the spleen is what's being what's capturing the platelets, but the weird thing about it is, if that has splenectomy, especially adults, they have some acne, and then, and, you know, clears up, but then they can get it again. The immune system still, even without the spleen, 
uh, doing the filtration, the antibodies start forming again because it's part of that um, memory cell kind of thing. And for some reason, it has to, to flare up and people will even with this one after sometimes. But here, it's curative, and a lot of people, they have to do that. Um, and that's one of these mysteries we don't all understand. Maybe, maybe some immunologists do, but, but I don't think that's something we have to go into great detail in. All right, and this is, okay. It might spontaneously resolve if there's a hemorrhage because of the decrease platelets or the patient needs surgery. They might use other transfusions just as a temporary measure. It's not really going to help a whole lot, but if you're not producing enough, you need to have a baseline of platelets to be um, 50,000 or so before they really just have to have surgery. You'd rather not have to get have surgery on somebody like that, but if it's an emergency surgery, you've got to load them up with platelets and go ahead and get the surgery done right quick until, um, and that the, because the body's going to destroy those those platelets too, for us, so that it's not, they're not going to last very long. So um, we, we do use corticosteroids like prednisone um, that's an immune suppressant and will suppress those, those T cells that are going wacko. And then um, immunosuppressive drugs like Imuran, it's called, it's azathioprine, um, is, um, uh, is that, that's the uh, generic name. And then cyclophosphamide, that's when you had to look up in the cellular unit, didn't you? So this, it's a chemo drug, but um, Imuran is very similar. It's a, an alkylating agent that brings the, the strands of the, of the DNA um, also. But, it's, but it does tend to decrease T cells that are the aspects of the problem. So, um, and then the intravenous immune globulin, it's, it's antibodies, other people's antibodies. And then rituxan is a, a targeted therapy. Um, Transfusions are not routinely used to prevent the bleeding because okay, they don't last any longer than the patient's natural ones do. Um, and then um, the bone marrow function is inherited to inhibit the function of the cells. Anyway, the immune globulin um, is made from uh, plasma of donated human blood. And, you know, some, some of the scary things that I heard, I don't know if this is really true anymore, but that. And then some people that really are, are just hard pressed for money will will go to some of these donation centers on a regular basis and get paid for yeah. um, you know the, these donations and then they uh, so it's not really a donation free donation but they do they they do a, um, they withdraw the blood and then, or they run it through a, um, a filter and, and, and take the take the antibody um, uh, antibodies out and that's not how they do it. But uh, sometimes people can be behaved and wonder if they don't have the best antibodies. Um, if they're um, living on the street or something like that, and so that's basically what's going on with that street. But anyway, um, it, it also, and as well as being able to give people antibodies for the to fight infections, like people with um, human therapy or, or people that have um, um, inherited immune disorders and they, they don't have uh, enough immunity of their own. Um, that, that uh, you know, you, you're just, that's your uh, passive um, immunity where, where you're getting somebody else's antibodies, like you're, you're borrowing that antibody function from somebody else. But then it's going to, it's going to wane and they're going to wear, wear out and it's that type of repeatedly. The condition is permanent. But anyway, um, they, these things, the immunoglobulin and the rituxan, um, rituxan actually attaches to, to certain kinds of T cells. And so that's why rituxan can work. That's actually a targeted therapy of chemo for, the, used for lymphoma, and there's some other diseases and that they're using it for. But it also can decrease the, it, it decreases the, the uh, T cells that are, that are um, causing the problem, like you said. But um, you just wonder, um, what this act mechanism of action is. That's what Kelly had given me all this information on um, ITP and IBIG and everything. And it's, it says the mechanism of how does it work in autoimmune diseases, or like with, with, um, with Joey's mom, how does it work in, in that kind of situation when you're actually giving antibodies. But we kind of figure that it's, it's kind of mixing up the immune cells. And if you've, already, if you've got somebody else's antibodies in there and it's doing the work, then you don't have to 
produce as many yeast samples of your own and everything, and, and may, maybe, I, and maybe it just mixes things up. That's what we kind of concluded last year when we were discussing this, but, but um, they, they really don't know exactly um, how to that works. So, um, but you can actually have hypersensitivity reactions in two guys the IG, which is kind of, that's kind of a, um, Ironic, I guess, that you're having a hypersensitive reaction to see your own platelets, and then what they give you to treat that can cause more different reaction too. So that's, that's a little, little weird, but that uh, can happen. You have to be really careful um, given IBIG at a certain rate. And, um, and there's certain, we had a patient that, that had an inherited um, immune deficiency, and she had to have regular IT or IBIG, and we had to use a certain brand. And if we didn't give her that brand, she would always have a reaction, even if she gave her benzoyl and, and um, steroids beforehand. So um, that, that was just really, really strange, <laughs> the way her immune system worked. Just that one brand, uh, just built a little differently or something. So, uh, but anyway, it's, it can um, cost a $4,000 a day for Kelly Toys last year. $4,000 And if she brings it up in the classroom, pulls it out of the box and hands it to me so I can show everybody. I'm like, Kelly, why don't you show it to them? I don't want to drop this thing. And you get $4,000. It's like, oh my gosh. So anyway, because uh, that was for her. She had to, I think she had to purchase it the way her insurance works. She had to purchase it from one place and then take it in um, to, to be administered someplace else. So, so anyway, this is not supposed to be in the original um, concept-based curriculum, but that is one of the things that they wanted us to, to add. So we, that was our option, but I think it's something that's good for you to know about. All right. Oh, and I, the other thing I was going to say about this is we had a, a patient that we were given, I don't know why it keeps doing that, um, that we were giving um, IVIG to, I don't know, we had given her up some chemo drugs too, but um, but she, she, um, she, she was diabetic, and I might have told you this last semester, but she, she was um, having her roof repaired, and she, she lived by herself, and so she was kind of seeing how the, the, um, the roofers were getting along, and, and so she just walked around. She had shoes on, and she was walking around her house and seeing how if everything was okay, and then, then um, a few days later, she just she just noticed all this blood in her shoe, and and um and she had stepped on a roofing nail and didn't even know it because of her diabetic neuropathy. Well, the the strange thing about me, she so she gets this bad infection in her foot, and and then her platelets just start shooting up. I mean, just like normal. They got to normal. They they were never normal just given the IVIG or the chemo or whatever. They were never normal. It would make it shoot up, but not not to, to normal levels. But it was it was just the weirdest thing that the immune system was was zeroing in on focusing on treatment that, that uh, infection and then and it happened another time she got pneumonia and and her platelets shot up it's like the immune system okay okay this is the priority we're not gonna not gonna attack platelets right now we're gonna go attack this pneumonia it's just it was really really strange how that that works so anyway that's that was just the fun fact to know engineer kind of thing. I think I, I think I break all of these things somehow or other. But okay, we got to move on to from the cytotoxic to the type three, which is immune complex mediated, and that um, is IgG and IgM also. But it, it puts the complexes into the circulation. It's not just at the cell level. It's, it's in the circulation. So um, it can occur in the kidneys. In, in the organ sometimes too, um, for stress infections or, or lupus, and it causes an accumulation of the immune complex, but it kind of starts in, in the bloodstream and then it catches in the kidneys. Um, and then you can have the glomerular nephritis. That's why people with lupus can have problems with their kidneys. Um, and then dust from moldy hay and farm workers, sometimes they can have this um, lung response and, and the, the immune complexes will, will settle in the lung. Um, and then it, um, it, if you have it systemically, then you got fever and hives and rash and achy joints and achy muscles and, and then the, um, the increased uh, sensitivity and size of the, of the left legs. Okay, so that, those complexes go to the vessel walls and then sometimes outside of the, the, the um, vessels into the tissues. And the complement is activated and that's what can cause all that lysis and and uh, um, maybe cytosis and everything, it flags, um, all these other uh, troops to come in. 
and then it attracts neutrophils to the site. They try to, to um, eat up the immune complexes and the enzymes are released and then the tissue is damaged. So the enzymes make the tissue suffer. So if it's the, the kidneys, if it's the lungs, um, or even in, in the, sometimes the vascular spaces, you know, you're going to have some tissue damage. And there's some information on, on this in Iggy. There's a figure on page 391 in Iggy. But this one's another one of the, the ones that, that came from the other book. And it, it just shows you the, the, the process of the, of the complexes forming um, in the vessel walls and in other body tissues, activating complement, and then um, infiltration of polymorphonuclear leukocytes, uh, po the polys. Um, and that's that's the the polys are the um, are the actual neutrophils. But okay, and then followed by the release of the lysosomes. So lysosomes is enzyme that's gonna gonna eat it up. And then you can have really extensive tissue damage with this. So that's that's the that's where we're gonna get into um, our our RA and our our lupus because that's that's what's happening there. Okay, and um, one of the big examples is the serum sickness. That's not something that we see so often anymore, but that's usually when animal serum is administered to humans and the proteins from that other, other animal elicit an antibody response. But um, I don't know how they do this with, with PET scans, but it used to be with PET scans you got a contrast that was that was partly mouse. You know, they call it chimeric when it's um, another species blended with human. Um, uh, with human serum and all that, that uh, if, if you if you blend it, it's called chimeric, and um, and so the that mouse um, the mouse molecules and everything could elicit an immune response. So when when PET scans first came out, you couldn't have but one. If you have one PET scan, and that's all you could have because you couldn't get mouse antibodies again, because you could the mouse antigens again, the antibodies would cause this kind of response. And then they fixed that somehow, and all the but that was the way it was. And, <laughs> this one was from, from cows and pigs. They had porcine and, and bovine insulin. And so um, and some people that would elicit some, some um, immune responses and then that it wouldn't work for the, uh, the, the patients anymore. So now we have a, a, the human human kind uh, and we don't have to deal with that anymore. But um, when I was doing um, working with kidney transplant patients some on, on when I first came out of nursing school, um, they would have, sometimes they would have a reaction to their transplant because um, if it was a, it's not a, not a perfect um, a twin and a transplant, um, there were a few of the antigens that would cause them the rejection of, of the, the new kidney. And so with, um, what we would end up doing if the new kidney wasn't working, we'd have to give a peritoneal dialysis. And um, sometimes if the peritoneal wasn't working well enough, they'd send them down to, to um, to, to have hemodialysis. We couldn't do that in, in the room. We could do the peritoneal that way. But um, they actually, um, for this one patient, they gave him a ATG. I think that is mentioned in your book. It's antithymocyte globulin. That means it's against T cells. And, or ALG, anti-leukocyte. Um, no, leukocyte. But anyway, that's, that's what we're going to transplant. And um, I remember was that it, it, had, it was really high in sodium for some reason, and that the people would get a lot of edema. And, and this guy that, that, was, uh, that I had been, been working with, he was just in his 30s and it had, had transplant and was, was really getting along pretty well, and, but that, that ATG can, can cause some, some problems. But anyway, he, he ended up um, arresting and dying in, um, in dialysis, and, and they think that it may have been because of that, that OTG thing, that he, he may have had some, some sort of reaction to it for, because he had had that OTG. But I wish I could remember all the details on it. That's just kind of a, kind of a weird thing. But, um, and that's been a long time ago, of course. They, they, things are a lot better now, than, and they're not using near as much. You just hardly ever see that. But serum sickness is one of the, the hallmark um, type 3 reactions. Okay. And there, there is our type three picture again. Okay, so let me get the other direction. Okay. All right, delayed hypersensitivity. This is cell mediated. So we're talking about so which which kind of lymphocyte 
uh, takes care of the cell mediated responses? The T, you're right, and then the B cells do do the antibodies, right? So this is this is definitely a, a, a T cell um, situation. And then, you know, I've, I've been talking about the T cells are what you're suppressing, and so, but but the really the in the end is the antibodies that cause the <laughs> destruction. But here, this is this does not have to do with B cells at all. The T cells call in the antibodies. I don't want to confuse you with that. The other ones. The, the T cells are in the process, but they're really um, flagging it for the, the antibodies to be produced and all that. So, so um, they're just they're just sort of helpers at that particular point. But this this is totally about T cells in this one. It's not about um, the other antibodies. So. Um, it's an exaggerated interaction, like contact dermatitis. We talked about that um, in uh, in the um, in, in 111. So that was one of our exemplars. But latex allergy usually starts as a type four, the delayed hypersensitivity. That means that you're exposed to like the latex, but then it, it doesn't show up as any kind of reaction, like rash or anything, for for a couple of days. And so, um, and that's common in, in people with certain health conditions. We'll talk about that in a minute too. But you do you have to have measures to protect against the latex allergy. The latex is in, uh, if the latex is in the hospital and home environment, we're not seeing the gloves as much. But what, what still has latex in it? Like? <coughs> so that they might. And what about Foley's? Don't they have, oh, yeah. most of the Foley kits, they, those are latex Foley's, aren't they? I guess that's still a cheaper way to do it, but what would you do if your, if your patient stated that they had latex allergy and then you had to put a Foley in and you only have, um, have the, the, those kits with the, with the rubber? The Call actual. to get a non-latex so you go. You have to talk to Central Supply and get get something that's not latex, right? Because that's not stocked. Well, at least at Rowan, I haven't seen them stocked on, on the floor, and right, or in all different sizes and all that sort of thing. Maybe they are. Did some of y'all work at Rowan, or do they have any on the floor now? No, you have to call. I, I have, what's that? You have to call. The CDC. You have to call. So that's still, yeah, that's that's the last thing I remembered. So anyway, um, good to, okay. Um, this is 24 to 48 hours, I believe, like the improved days and, and another source. So that this is another thing where you're even in the same, same book sometimes where it's like two different points. But, but it just takes a, a, a day, one to three days, I believe, to the um, exposure to the Okay. Um, and then this is also another example of the EPD test because you have to wait. You can't um, take your take your PPD and use your dermal injection and then, then just read it right away, right? We have to wait for two days, don't you? And that and that what everybody's having to do with their with their PPD. So it, it is a delayed response type of thing with the with the deal with the T cells and all that too. And a, a lot of times there's a, in in all these tests that you're going to be taking as, as you go along in the program that they talk about latex allergy a whole lot. And so this is something that's why I've got this paragraph in the next page. Um, there's cornstarch to power latex gloves, um, aerosolizes, and then people can inhale that aerosol that's got the latex in there, so they're allergic, and even somebody else is wearing the gloves, and that, that, um, that power gets in the air, then um, that can cause a reaction. And, um, um, so that's, that's, a, that's a dangerous thing. Oh, I love power gloves, so they were so easy to get on, you just slime right in there, and that's, but, but um, it really, it would irritate my, my skin. I didn't, I don't think I had a you know, bad reaction or anything, but, but uh, it would get around my watch and, and the, the powder would, would stay <laughs> underneath my watch. I would get a, I would get a, um, a red mark that was the shape of my watch <laughs> underneath there. And so, so I started wearing a watch with the, just around my neck for a while. But uh, people that, that have, that, that are predisposed to have latex allergies or people, especially healthcare workers that, that wear gloves a lot, that's, that's probably the main one. But in some of your conditions is, is on spina bifida, you know, children with three or more surgeries, um, myeloid and dyslexia, people that don't have a blood cell production, um, congenital urinary tract abnormalities, and bladder, when the bladder is at, outside of the body, that is, um, is a birth defect. And, and people that use latex condoms a lot, and then, um, of course, just in any of latex glove use too. But uh, why do you think all those people with with bladder problems and surgeries end up having having more 
um, potential for it. Because of the catheters and all. Yes, exactly. And be exposed to the, the natural rubber. So, you want to remove the antigen as soon as possible. Anytime that you have um, this, this type of reaction, you want to try just not to be exposed to it anymore. That's, that's the most sensible thing to do. Um, and, and it actually, the, the poison oak, poison ivy, and all that, that's contact herbitis. That's, um, that's something that you want to just try to avoid. If you see those three leaves, you need to need to vamoose, right? But, so those people can still break out, even if they didn't touch the leaves. How else could they break out? How else might they be able to be exposed to it, even though they didn't touch it? But, Somebody else. What about what we said about the latex gloves with the powder? And the aerosol. Yeah, you can breathe in the pollen and all that stuff. Yes, yes. So, so that's that could be dangerous if you're really very allergic. My mom used to love this. She was exposed to the poison and all that stuff. So she was exposed to the poison. And she would wash clothes and the kids were running around in the woods or the dog would be running around in the woods. And um, she she got him to bring that stuff in, and even if she didn't touch it um, with her hands, then, then she, she would break out to the whole of all that her life. She used to go have that situation, and uh, she hadn't had that problem recently. Maybe it's because she's older and her immune system's not as strong, I don't know. But anyway, um, you do look on Ig in Iggy, page 391. It doesn't have a table there, but that's where they talk about the latex allergies and about ways to avoid latex and all that. So does that that make sense to y'all? And I think y'all probably know all that, but I'm supposed to tell you anyway. So um, the type four response, you can look at this, the, the antigen presenting cell, and then there's the T cells itself that's going to join to it, sort of like a lock and key that's not an antibody, but it's, a, it's joined in as a lock and key to that antigen. And then the, these lymphokines are, are communicating in, in between cells and and uh, the lysosomes and the, and the, the macrophage is, is um, coming in to, to destroy. So, because uh, the T cell doesn't destroy it by itself, the macrophage gets gets called to do that because of this communication with those little granule, granules um, and extracellular fluid. So, okay. Um, let's see if there's anything else that was. Yeah, that description is pretty much what's on that picture. That's what really it's talking about. I'm not going to go go read that to you. I don't know why this one. This one's just the opposite of that other one. Okay, type five. It's so strange. Type five is not in in Giddens, but it's in it's in Indy. And it was not in the concept book that we used last year, but it was in the previous Iggy book. So I guess some people recognize the type 5 and some people don't. But, but anyway, we are going to talk about it because it, it's, it, it, it does happen. So this is when uh, there's in, inappropriate stimulation of normal cell surface receptors. So the normal cell surface receptors are, are tagged as, are flagged as antigens or foreign antigens. When they're they're really not foreign, but the, it just gets all mixed up. So anyway, um, yeah, the, the it turns on the the function of the organ, just like that the Graves disease, that that form of hyperthyroidism. You know, that is a, an autoimmune kind of thing. I think we we mentioned that with people with, and at least in the Google group we did that that um, people with um, diabetes, type one diabetes, is an autoimmune situation. Um, that that um, they, they can have more likely to have thyroid disease or have a, a Graves disease so their, their thyroid's checked quite often or should be. My daughter had one endocrinologist and she had to remind them to check the back to remind them to check the back um, some urine tests and stuff like that. That's a really terrible endocrinologist and why I'm in the problem. Anyway, um, and we talked about the thymus gland being where, where the, the T cells mature, and but the thymus gland at myasthenia gravis, that's, that is a type 5 stimulatory reaction. It just turns it, it's continuously turned on. It's not, not just when, when the body needs it. It's supposed to be like a biofeedback mechanism when the body needs their thyroid stimulating hormone that, um, that's supposed to be telling your thyroid when to put out the T cells for and all that. Um, and produce it, but instead it's just turned on all the time. And that's, that's really what, that's what my nephew had. He, he took some kind of medication to suppress that, but it didn't, didn't, didn't work for very long, and then he ended up taking the, um, uh, 
the three months that I've got to talk to them recently, but he, he's just going to be graduating from the seminary in Columbia, South Carolina in, in May, and his wife is graduating from medical school in May. She's at, at Texas. They have to live apart right now. They've just been married for a year, but they have to live apart for a while. But they're, they, um, they're going to be in Winston-Salem, so that's going to be so cool that they were trying to find a place where, where he could uh, find a, a Lutheran church somewhere nearby and, and uh, she, could, she could do her residency and she's going to be on the but, uh, Anyway, I don't want to get to the Palestinian residency in Winston before long. Okay, and, and uh, this, that's really goodness. Um, that is one that... But I, I, on my printout, I can, I can read it, but it's not really that great. And on here, I probably need to change that. Um, and it, it's different, different um, projectors do it a little bit differently, too. But anyway, this, this is a, the one that Ms. Van Bertlow put together. It's really just a summary of the kind. You don't really have to memorize this necessarily. Because some of these things say immediate, but it could be... You know, the, this is just like 30 minutes, five to eight hours, two to eight hours. So, so um, um, anyway, the, there, there's um, um, yeah, I, I know, I know that in Iggy, there's a, it, it says it a little bit differently. We just realize that this type one can be fast, and and I didn't say about about the latex allergy. It can actually change over to to an antibody mediated one, uh, the IgE mediated one. If you if you have um, continuous um, episodes with it, it can actually turn and that they, your body can start making antibodies and it's not just a T-cell reaction and that's when it's really dangerous that um, you, you start having that free IgE that's, that's um, focused on, on the latex and then so they, it actually can cause anaphylactic reactions which is a type, type 1 it moves from type, type 4 um, to type 1 and I, that, that's very important to remember too. Um, let me see if there's anything else new on there. That I, but this is really good to, to um, see that, that the blood transfusion belongs here. And, of course, this, this is the hemolytic anemia, but the ITP goes here, too. So you may want to write that in if you've got it printed out, that ITP goes in this, this cellular one, cytotoxic one as well, and that, the, that this could be um, latex allergy that has converted over to antibody-mediated rather than just the T-cell, the delay. So I think the rest of that's pretty pretty clear to um, that, but I think that'll help you. That that, that helps you to have the reads on that. We want to finish our. I hope. I think that, that makes it easier to look at. Did y'all print out okay that you could see it? All right. So um, there's a lot of people that have have um, uh, hypersensitivity in our country and all over the world. You know. So. Um, the immune response can decrease with age, though. There's a the pure hypersensitivity reaction. Well, it's just a few years ago, my mother and I had a couple of this last semester, too. She just fell out. And my foundation, the Jewish Royal Man Hospital Foundation, um, did her. And, and there were all these doctors from Barry Caldwell to sit with her and, and say, <coughs> and all this. And, and, uh, and she just fell out. And she, but she ate shrimp, but she knew she was allergic to shrimp. It would make her a little itchy. But it was like she she started, she had made more and more grand bodies and just eating that shrimp at that dinner, just boom, and she just passed out. And they thought she had cardiac stuff going on, but it, they, they finally um, determined that, that it was it was more, it was a, a, a lung crack. So, but she can't have shellfish and she can't eat peanuts either. So, but, but she's still having, having um, hypersensitivity. So I guess her immune system is still very active, even though she's been with Peter Dolly. Um, Okay, anyway, what we want to do, this, this is more just general stuff. We, we want to focus minimizing exposure to the allergen, of course, and we don't want people to be taking blood that's not matched to them, and, uh, and we don't want to be exposed to poison oak, poison oak latex, and any of those things that, that uh, we know bothers us. And, and then you take a history um, of the person about what, what they have already experienced so that you'll know how to take care of them when they are, they are in the hospital. Um, and of course, we got to do our ABCs to take care of people if they are having a reaction in our, our presence, uh, certainly. And um, if they if they keep having um, recurrent problems, then you want to refer them to a to a specialist. And um, and uh, the the children, especially the children that have uh, peanut allergies and such, need to be um, the, the parents need to be educated on how to deal with, with school or 
the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or wherever the, the, uh, the child is going to be um, involved, their soccer coach, any, anybody. That, um, and I think it was so good that that guy said something about, this is why you have to have to tell people if you have peanuts in your cookies. <laughs> you remember him saying that? And, and that, that really makes makes sense because it, it's not really safe anymore like to bring a snack to, to the soccer team. You, you made homemade cookies and you got nuts, you know, peanuts, and of course even other nuts that may have been produced in a factory that processed the peanuts. You know, that could happen. You know, when you crash, you know, that problem. Okay, so let's lab testing. We'll, we'll look for our WCCs with our differential. We'll look for increased blood. When it's, when, which one is the one that signals in the more allergies? Yes, yeah. yeah. right. And um, this RAST test, uh, blood type and cross match, may be something that we do. Sometimes we'll do the indirect Coombs test. Indirect Coombs test, that's those extra antibodies that you might check for on people that have had allergic reactions before um, instead of just a regular cross match. And then, um, um, the new complex assays, you can handle all the factors and things like that, complement assays. Um, and then the RAST measures by the clean that's directed to the specific antigen. So that, that's what that one does. And um, when, when you're doing a blood transfusion, you, um, those of you who work in the hospital have probably seen this, that two, two RNs have to check off on it and make sure that that's the, the correct patient and the correct blood type and, and the, um, it, it's, uh, it's really, really important. They take um, uh, vital signs uh, baseline and then every 15 minutes for, for so long and, um, and I do have that about the antibodies on here but you need a new type of cross match with the days at the time of the transfusion over a extended period. Sometimes it might come in um, with a trauma or, or bleeding of some sort of diabetes where they'll start a newer type of cross match but then they have the blood with the 72 hours, they, yeah, they're just taking it just in case. Then they, so that's why that's when you would find it, that somebody might have to have another, another cross match. Okay, skin testing. Um, that, that helps to determine the cause. I said, so my, my daughter had that done. Um, they, do, they do a prick test where you do a drop of diluted extract placed on the skin and then pricks through the drop. And then a patch test can be a one inch patch that's soaked with uh, the allergen applied to the skin for 48 hours. Um, especially if, if um, you had a, um, already had a quick test, but then that's, you don't always do a patch test or a quick test and you didn't show anything. Um, and then the, the food allergy test, you do a food environment, elimina do an elimination diet, um, and as the symptoms are relieved, you, you get reintroduced foods to, to try to detect which, which is the culprit if, if it might be a food allergy. Okay, and then you do the intradermal injection sometimes. Um, that it's the same technique for the, the PPD test for TB. Um, and if, if you've had a negative response to the prick test, you have a larger dose and increase the risk for the reaction though. And so there's a small amount of allergen extract injected in the forearm or the, in the scapula area and on the back of the prick test. And you need to, the big thing to remember here on this slide is that you need to have emergency equipment on hand and in case of anaphylaxis can it, it can happen. And some people even with the teeny teeny tiny doses of the allergen, they may just they may be so sensitive to it that it just sorry about that, I can't find it. Okay. Um, and I have a little video that I posted it on here just so you wanted to, to see it here. Is we we want to with our with our pharmacologic therapy if, they, if there's indeed allergies we can give antihistamines that's kind of our most popular one isn't it and we um, block our histamine from binding to the receptor so that's how that's what antihistamines do um, it blocks it at the, at the receptor so we can, and we we've, um, we've had other other medications that block at the receptor like like tamoxifen blocks at the receptor um, for um, Estrogen. And so that prevents the vasodilation that histamine causes in the capillary leak. And then um, you do have some, some problems with, um, with 
being sleepy though and having dry mouth, and that's that's very very common. And I think we talked about that a little bit in in the eleven when we were talking about contact dermatitis, maybe using Benadryl. What you need to warn your patients about when they're taking Benadryl. Don't dry. Cause the swollen. Don't dry. Make it dry. That's the point. And then the Clarinex and the, the Zyrtec and the Allegra are, are like second generation antihistamines and they, they can cause drowsiness but they're not as likely to. Uh, and then you can have prescription and non-prescription um, strengths. You can do a Benadryl and lots of things now and it's so, so cheap. If people just knew that Dr. Hydra was a Benadryl, then they've got this new, um, you said it was it NyQuil? Just for sleep or something like that? Z-Quil. What did you say? Z-Quil. Z-Quil. Right. It's, it's probably the same NyQuil people. I, mean, I think that's probably what I'm saying, like sleep is disease or whatever. But um, it's just it's just Benadryl, isn't it? I don't think I'm late, but I think I think it is just Benadryl, and, and I bet that that brand name Zequil is making all these big bucks when you could just go go get over the counter um, Benadryl at Family Dollar and pay ninety five cents for it. Okay. So, anyway, people don't don't always know that. I, I'm a cynic, or not, but you know, my my cynic. So anyway, the H1 blockers have been really clear things on that. And, um, they, they don't really have bad responses to allergens, and that, that can actually make it worse. Um, they can do H1 blockers. There's actually an H1 blocker uh, for that's a uh, antihistamine for hydrox. And the tagamet is H2 blocker, and Zantac and Pepsi and all those are H2 blockers that, that actually you, you take for for stomach blocking stomach acid, that's what what it was um, you know it's originally for. But you can you can use um, you can block the H2. We, we used to give um, H2 blocker, an H1 blocker, and a steroid for some medications that would would uh, elicit a lot of uh, just try to block it every way that you possibly can, knowing that it's it's so dangerous to try to get it from without pre medication. And they'll do that a lot of times with blood transfusions too. Sometimes they'll just get Tylenol and then drill it for blood transfusion. But they could certainly do a, um, do something do steroids as well if they needed to. Um, yeah, there we go. And then decongestants, you've got oral or nasal sprays. It does not clear the allergen or, or prevent the release of histamine. It doesn't block anything in the receptor. It just they do constricts. And so when it vasoconstricts, then that can decrease the edema and the inner nose. And, and that, the day I told you about last semester, about I just got a tooth bag because I get swollen in my eustachian tooth and it just sends these nerve impulses up in the back of my head. I feel like my head's going to explode and all this. And, and so if I take some Tylenol and, and Sudafed, it just, that's the only thing that will re, um, relieve it. Just Tylenol by itself or ibuprofen or naproxen, nothing nothing like that relieves it all the way. It will help, but then, then the Sudafed just, that's where, where the, the, um, the problem is, is the, the, um, the, the basic constrict and then um, it gives me a fluid path and it, it, it keeps those, those nerves from being stimulated. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Corticosteroids. We've, we've learned a whole lot about corticosteroids. Um, about the, the um, it does. This says that it suppresses bone marrow stem cell proliferation. But when what we and, and so it, it does mean that if you if, it, if you're suppressing the stem cell proliferation, then what are we going to have a risk for? Anemia. Well, anemia. And what else? So what, what other cells are in it? What? Yeah, and and white blood cells in particular. So you do have risk for infection when you're on on steroids, right? So so risk for infection is is a biggie. Um, another thing, um, I think I wrote it on something here. I can't remember where I put it. Well, that, that's something I want to make sure that you knew that sometimes that when your patients like your your uh, COPD exacerbation, your patients always they're on a steroid, aren't they? And and you can sometimes see that they're they're um, 
their white blood cells are elevated somewhat, and that that can can certainly. It doesn't mean they aren't risk for infection, though. It's just that it, it does just temporarily um, raise raise the, the white blood cell count. Um, but it's a it, it's a, that's usually a temporary thing. But it doesn't mean that that's enhancing their their immunity. Not at all. So. Um, being inhaled and, and that sort of thing too, and an inhaler so it doesn't have to have as much um, uh, systemic sign in it. Whatever. All right, mast cell stabilizers. Those are like the nasal crumb, the chromalin sodium. Um, it, it keeps them from releasing the, the chemical mediators when with the um, IgE binding. And that, the leukotriene modifier is like the singular. That's, that's the biggest example one. Way that we find are made by the mast cells and the neutrophils and the basic cells and all that. So then that causes the edema and inflammation and bronchoconstriction. So leukotrienes are another mediator of inflammation. This is really that's just another one that they discovered in the, the last is fairly recently compared to some of the others. All right, desensitization is, is what you do with allergy shots. And the concentration is increased over time, and it takes about five years to totally desensitize somebody. Sometimes it doesn't work either. Um, but you uh, gradually increase the dosage of the product. And you know, this is tremendous, tremendous deletion. And um, once you finish the, the vial of that or a certain period of time with the, the, the very most diluted version, then you go to you go to vial two. And Dr. Black is allergy shots. I used to have to give them these allergy shots. I used to have to order it for him and all that kind of stuff. But um, uh, typically you have somebody wait for about 30 minutes to a half an hour in the office after they've had their allergy shot just to make sure that there's not going to be a, a reaction because you're increasing the um, amount of the antigen. And, um, and you need to make sure again that, that you, but it's like you were with allergy testing that you've got emergency equipment at hand in case it relaxes the problem. So that, that's a big deal. Um, so a lot of times the allergic rhinitis and asthma related to inhaled allergens and, and uh, insect venom and allergy like the, the bees things. Um, and then the, the client actually develops IgG antibodies to the allergen when it's slow like that. And that way it overwhelms the IgE because the IgG is the major um, immunoglobulin and so if you, you can kind of trick your immune system into making IgG um, against it, um, then it blocks the IgE response. And then, then you can become not allergic to it anymore because IgG is what causes that type of response. And it balances the, uh, the immune system out and really not going to have such, such suffering. All right. And here, this, this is some stuff that you really need to, to look at. When you're starting to have a general reaction, um, a lot of times the patient will say, I'm just scared. Something's, something's not right. I'm just scared. And they feel like they're, the world's going to end and they're, they're just really terrified. But in the ending noon, um, you have itching, itching with, with or without a rash. But, um, most of the time there's a rash. Without tasting the mouth, it's your eyes, sneeze, and you don't know all of that. Hives as possible. And, and the facial and lip swelling, sometimes angioedema is not real serious enough to just block the airways, but you might have some 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 swelling, kind of like on the lips or something like that. And there there are some page numbers listed on the, the notes page you can look up some more on um, the media about that. And the moderate, and we can have some more systemic kinds of things going on, dizziness, weakness, nausea, vomiting, bloody diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, urgency, or incontinence of the feces, or urine. Um, urine cramps. Um, and it, one thing that I have seen too is like this back pain. <coughs> some some chemo drugs and, and, um, and targeted therapies and IVIG too. Um, when people were having a reaction, the first thing would be like something would hit them, hit them from the front and, and settle in their back. Like like somebody had just stepped on their chest and then then settled in the back and they just kind of like sit up like they just um, that, that it's just a horrible pain, like something hit up from the shot or something. Uh, up and say some kind of practice is killing me. Um, but um, anyway, that's, that, that pain can be a disease. <coughs> I've seen that a lot of times. 
And then um, severe is the syndrome you know, seizures and you get of the upper airway where you can't get your air free. That's where you start to get all that ABC stuff really bad. Um, bronchus bad and stride or wheezing, dyspnea, tachypnea, what is tachypnea? It's really, really fast, it's shallow, so you're not getting a whole lot of oxygenation going on with the shallow breathing. And then the, um, with the cardiovascular, you can have cardiovascular collapse, hypotension, and then and the arrhythmias, and then you can have the area of shock. And this is, this is where I can show them the <coughs> here. But the other, the other uh, PowerPoint is kind of short. So. Okay. Um, Management, and this is what you do in an emergency department. A lot. This is sort of busy. That this is this is not something that that you're going to probably see so so terribly often. But but the first thing is if somebody comes in the in the emergency room with an allergic reaction with anaphylaxis, we got to do ABCs, right? I mean that that's just the, the, with this severe when you got the bronchus spasms and you're not you're turning blue. The guy said he turned blue. Um, and then we got airway compromise. We're going to use epinephrine because epinephrine is vasoconstricting because we like to block epinephrine like reactions we're trying to get blood pressure down, don't we? But in this particular situation, it constricts the, the, the uh, blood vessels, but it dilates the, the bronchial area. So that's why that's good. I, and I did put, if, if they're monitored and everything, they can give it IV, but IM is preferred over sub-Q. When we were in our in the office, um, our, our kind of standing order was that we would give um, the, give the, the epinephrine um, 1 to 1,000 um, sub-Q because we were in an office situation and we wouldn't have them monitored immediately. We'd just go ahead and get them the epinephrine just as quick as we could if they didn't have an EpiPen. And most of our people didn't because you weren't expecting them to be allergic. But if we had an allergic reaction to a medication, we would do that. And then we went up to have cardiac monitoring for any repeat dosing. Um, so you probably want somebody to get to the ER as quick as, as possible if they have a reaction like in the office or something like that. But if they're unresponsive to the epinephrine, you can use glucose glucagon or norepinephrine. But if you can remember the epinephrine part, I think that's that's the most important thing. The epinephrine is bronchodilating and that's what we're trying to do is get our ABCs straightened out. So and there's a, there's a emergency care and drug therapy and all in in Iggy and Gibbons too that, that kind of that goes goes back over this. Um, and let's see if you yeah, I've got those things listed on there. I have to scribble it online. But usually, usually if you do it so cute, like in all the situations, the one to one thousand is, is sufficient, and, and that's the way that we, we purchase guys. So that's what we would have handy. Um, we have to have our. Sometimes they have to do the endotracheal tube, an emergency tracheostomy, if if it takes a while for the airway to get back opened up. Um, plasma paresis is something that they, they may um, have to do when blood spills into a cell separator, and that, that's like how many people are And they, they use paresis to treat the good pasture syndrome, the one that affects the, the kidneys, the blood glomerular nephritis. Um, and uh, you can have problems with the IV catheters and fluid balance and stuff like that when you're doing, uh, doing paresis. But they, they've been using paresis for a long time, though, with the, with the platelets and all. And so that's, that's, that's something that they get better and better at, actually. Complications are a lot less than they could have years ago. Um, and there are, there can be um, uh, hypersensitivity to things like some of the, the natural therapies or natural kinds of substances that we take in, like, like chamomile tea. I drink, I drink this um, sleepy time tea or sweet dream tea or something like that, and it's got chamomile in it. That's what I think I told you all about this. Like, that's what Peter Rabbit's mom, I think I didn't say it. Peter Rabbit's mom always told him to, to drink chamomile tea. Um, to settle his stomach and make him rest, and and, um, and so that's that's what that's what I like to, to take if I don't feel like I can get to sleep or if my stomach's feeling a little icky when I go to bed and eat too much grease food or supper or something, and you have the chamomile tea, it feels really good. And sometimes some people are allergic to it. You know, type one type of sensitivity. Okay, here we go. 
you've got urticaria, which is the hives uh, and the itching and flushing, and then the diphenhydramine, those are some um, normal doses and everything. 25 to 50 is a typical um, uh, adult dose, 25 to 50 IM or IV. Um, most of the time it's going to be IV, hopefully. And then the hypotension, um, you might have to give a lot of, um, a lot of fluid to, to um, replace the, the volume because in, in the vascular space, the cause of the edema. Um, and that, that seems to kind of be counterintuitive. That's what you need to do. You need to do that. And you might have to, to put them on kind of a vasopressor, which is Nebulizers, I think the nebulizers is what they would do to begin with. Um, they might have to do the intubation. Um, aminophilin is another vasodilator, that, but that aminophilin can cause an increased heart rate too. You have to be really careful, and so it's really better to patient monitor when you're doing something like that. And you may be given the hydrocortisone or sorry, the anti inflammatory. And then um, this, this doublator is on the, the notes page, and it was type 1 reaction to binds to the, the free IgE and prevents it from binding to the mast cell. But um, you have had that RAST testing and approval from the physician and insurance company and manufacturer, all this kind of stuff. It's really, really, really expensive, and it might take up to a year to work, but if it if it works, it might be worth all of that. But the, the insurance company is not real thrilled about all that. Um, and then um, I think y'all could probably uh, just read through some of this assessment and not that the, I'm not saying that this is not important, but I think that this is something that's not really new information. It's probably looks like somebody you know how to do about their airway clearance and all that sort of stuff. But what I want you to don't be patient about because this I got more important than that. But this is important things to say and then Walker needed to tell you something real quick right after. But um, you don't want to elevate your, the patient's head. You know, you know, when somebody's not breathing well, you want to elevate the head. But if they, um, if they're in shock, if they're they're in circulatory collapse or hypotensive, you don't want them to have their head up. You want their heart, their head to be um, at least even with their heart. And sometimes they, they will put people in trendelenburg trend position where the head is lower than the heart. But you need to. Um, so what I've got on the next page is, is a change from what I have have been taught in the past where you've got the decreased cardiac output um, and it says that once breathing has been established you place the client flat with their legs elevated instead of in Trendelenburg that's this is the the new standard when people have the uh, circulatory collapse kind of thing you don't want to have their head lower than the heart because the organs can, can push um, on their um, or their Way, way down, and beds still will go that way because, uh, you know, I think Taylor was showing us that the head does go all the way with the Trinelberg, still done it in those beds. And then, with the risk for injury for, for um, transfusion, um, again, we talked about the two, two RNs having to, to, um, to check it all, and that has to be uh, you have to check the informed consent for the blood products and um, see if they have reactions to previous transfusions. Um, a lot of times within 15 minutes, but you have to have a baseline as well. Um, and then you, a lot of times in the order, it's even in the documentary Benadryl, if you have a text in the end, and if you do want it to a separate infusion site, you don't get anything else along with the blood except to have some saline to the flush. Um, and you have to have at least a 20 gauge needle for, um, for the transfusion. And then, um, we already said a lot of that. We have to watch if the temperature increases, chills, um, increased uh, 
heart rate, increased breathing rate, or if there's wheezing, hypotension, hives, rashes, cyanosis, any of those, those kinds of things that we've been talking about that could be a, an anaphylactic reaction. If any of that happens, you've got to stop the, the transfusion immediately, and, and um, uh, no matter how mild, and, and investigate. And so I, usually they'll send the blood and the administration set to the, the lab, and they need to be getting, their, getting saline. Um, that you, you use um, you, the normal saline to prime the IV, and then then you um, uh, you just give them the give them saline um, afterwards, and, and send the, the uh, tubing and everything to the lab to see what's going on, if they're what what kind of thing that they're reacting to. Um, and you you have to give the blood over about two to four hours, and if it, if it's over four hours, you need to throw it away because it can start growing bacteria in it. So. And I, I think on this community-based and everything, um, I think y'all can look at that. We, we've already talked about contact dermatitis, and that that was um, that's really the same kind of stuff we talked about in 111. Exposed to skin to air. This says sun, but um, you know you have to be careful about the sun too, um, and, and avoid people with infection and all that. No no extremes of heat and cold if you're uh, susceptible to, to contact dermatitis. That's just a review of, of what we learned in one lesson. So.